Denise Rashford and I'm CEO of two positive investment in platforms, FX and Energize Africa. Um, today we will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 crisis on the off-grid solar market in Africa uh, and what the sector can do to overcome these challenges and uh, increase its resilience. Uh, so I've been joined today by uh, a very um, excellent panel, which I hope you will enjoy um, the discussion that we'll have today. So I'll just quickly run you through uh, who's joining us and then I'll just uh, run through some housekeeping and then I'll ask the panelists to very briefly introduce themselves before we get stuck into the main uh, questions. Um, good, so uh, I'd like to introduce Chavi Sharma, who's the International Program Manager from Ashton. You can give us a wave as I uh, introduce you so everybody knows who you are. Alex Brumella, who's Head of Finance and Innovation at Azuri Technologies. Erwin Spalders, who's CEO of Rudavia Solar. William Brent, who is Chief Campaign Officer for Power for All. And Tobias Grimwis, who's Lender Hand and Energize Africa Investment Team Lead. So today we have about 45 minutes scheduled for the webinar, but we can run to an hour if uh, there are lots of questions from yourselves. So you can submit the questions at any time during the discussion via the chat function. And I will try and field these and ask the questions to the organizations at the end of the uh, discussion. So obviously I just need to state that this discussion should not be treated as uh, financial advice in any way. And we can't answer any specific questions relating to your own personal financial circumstances. So this isn't a recommendation to invest, but please do follow up afterwards on the website Energize Africa if you'd like any more information or we will send a follow-up email as well um, with some useful resources if there's anything that um, comes up in the session which would be interesting to people. So um, perhaps in the order uh, that I previously read out, um, if everyone would like to just do a literally short two sentence introduction to who you are and what your organization does, uh, and then I'll kick off into the first question. So if we go, um, Chav, Erwin, William, and then Tobias, that would be great. Thanks, Lisa. I'm the International Program Manager um, at Ashton, as Lisa said. Ashton is a UK-based charity that helps accelerate energy access and uh, transformative climate solutions and build a more just world. We do this by supporting um, and promoting sustainable energy enterprises from around the world through our uh, awards program as well as um, our business support programs. Thanks Lisa um, and Chavi. Uh, so my name is Alex Brummeler. I lead the finance innovation team at Azuri Technologies. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, um, Azuri Technologies were a leading uh, Pago solar business founded in 2012 as a spin out from Cambridge University. And we basically, we've developed two core products. One is a lighting solar home system and the other one is a TV solar home system, and we've sold over 200,000 systems uh, across the continent, primarily in East Africa. My name is uh, Erwin Spolders. I'm the founder and CEO of Redavia. Uh, Redavia uh, offers solar farms on a least owned basis to businesses in Ghana, Kenya, and Tanzania. William. Hi, everyone. Yes, William Brent, the Chief Campaign Officer at Power for All. Power for All is a US-based NGO campaigning to end energy poverty uh, in an accelerated fashion through scaling decentralized renewable energy solutions. Thanks. Uh, hi, this is uh, Tobias speaking. I am uh, leading the investment team at Energize Africa. Uh, we're a UK-based uh, investment platform for which energy companies active in Sub-Saharan Africa can raise flexible financing. Um, think about, for example, Redavia and, uh, and Azuri Technologies. Those are two of our portfolio clients. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. So we're going to get right into the discussion. Um, now, obviously, we have been very aware of the effects of uh, COVID in our own um, countries uh, close to home and we can see that there are challenges for 
businesses and really this um, has affected everybody's economy quite dramatically. Um, we may be less aware of what's been happening um, in particular countries because you know every country is different within Africa. So uh, I'd like to just ask the um, panel, perhaps starting with Chavi and then um, William. So what have been the main issues facing the solar industry uh, in light of COVID-19? Chavi, if you'd like to start. Sure, I think that's a great question. Um, in Ashton's network, we've come across three main issues. Um, the first one being supply chain and the delays and disruptions that most off-grid uh, businesses face, um, particularly with the availability of product, um, as most businesses import uh, components and products from China. Um, the second thing that we have seen is uh, the business model and impact on sales and revenue especially for pay-as-you-go businesses and businesses serving low-income customers, where the ability uh, and willingness to pay has been really impacted as a lot of the customers are, are daily wages. The third thing that we have seen um, as um, Ashton is, you know, finances and financial planning. So it's a, a concern and a need for everyone, both in terms of debt for working capital and longer-term funding. And if as you said, Lisa, uh, first and foremost, sort of the uh, lockdown or government restrictions in place in each country has had a, a big uh, impact. So the larger businesses, especially those with an international footprint and uh, those operating across multiple countries, have really benefited uh, from people being confined to their homes as the reliance on electricity and the consumption of electricity has gone up. Businesses operating in one country, like Uganda, for example, where the um, lockdown has been particularly severe, or Nigeria um, have been really sort of impacted. Last mile distributors have had to work, uh, you know, had to really sort of stop their work in the lockdown because of the uh, social distancing policies um, that have made operations completely unviable. So it also sort of depends on the type of work that the businesses are doing. Some businesses have been able to get essential service status, um, exempting them from lockdown measures. And this has meant that they can continue operating as normal and keep their doors open. Whereas other businesses and mini grid businesses in particular have been badly impacted because there's often been a ban on construction. Um, also, what we have seen as uh, you know, Ashton is it really depends on the customer segment the businesses are serving. So businesses with a rural customer base have been and you know, in terms of safety of staff and vulnerability of staff as they uh, normally sort of go out to the rural areas selling their products. Um, and this has really, you know, also impacted their ability to organize uh, group demonstrations, customer demonstrations of their uh, product or, or service. Um, I think sort of, I would say, um, the size of the business and how quickly they have been able to adapt has made a big difference. If you look at one example, which is Peg Africa, they have really moved to working remotely, doing everything online and accepting contactless payments, which has really helped them, uh, you know, sort of uh, ride through the, the COVID storm. Whereas um, smaller businesses, particularly indigenous businesses, are not so lucky. They have limited resources, a very little uh, cash flow runway, um, and they're not in a position always to retain their staff and to forward plan. And we have really found that uh, this has made sort of a big difference if you're looking at the uh, main things, uh, you know, affecting the, the sector. Um, we've also seen funding uh, from smaller organizations that are struggling to survive. So I think all in all, sort of um, in Africa, we are looking at a mixed picture. Great. William, do you, can you add to that? Uh, that was a very comprehensive overview. So uh, I don't have a ton to add, but uh, I'll maybe just back up for one second and, and remember that 
uh, the energy access sector has made huge strides over the past decade uh, and been able to provide in, in large part due to donor support as well as commercial finance, uh, has been able to provide electricity and cook clean cooking solutions to hundreds of millions of people for the first time. Um, and that that progress would not have happened without the support of the international development community, donors, multilateral development banks, the private sector, uh, a, a range of stakeholders. And uh, we now are in a situation where uh, that progress is, is jeopardized for many companies. Uh, the surveys that uh, Chavi referenced, um, you know, point to the fact that many companies are looking at a three to four month window before uh, they face uh, more uh, intense financial difficulties because of COVID. Um, so, you know, all of the support and, and progress that's been made over the past decade, uh, I think we need to keep very uh, front of mind that that has been hard fought uh, and to be short sighted in this current situation and not provide the necessary support to make sure that these companies survive through this uh, crisis is, is, I would think, be a, a major mistake uh, and jeopardize the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is access for all. Um, I would also say that uh, just to stress that there is a, 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 you know, there are different types of companies within the sector, as 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 Xavi said, there are many medium and uh, s small enterprises uh, that make up the majority of the companies in this sector, and they're not able to put debt on their books the way larger companies like Azuri and Redavi are. Uh, and so they require much more grant funding and power for all and a range of other organizations have been quite vocal in making sure that not only are the larger, uh, more mature companies able to um, uh, survive and thrive through COVID, but also that these, uh, uh, the majority of companies, which are indigenous small companies, um, that they are also uh, able to access the financing they need to, to, to make it through. The last thing I would just say is on the consumer, uh, uh, on the consumer side and the ability to pay, uh, I think we're, we originally saw a uh, indications that uh, payment was not an issue, uh, but uh, a number of organizations, including Gogla and 60 Decibels, have been doing ongoing research to determine uh, impact uh, on ability to pay. And while it's not in, in a dire situation, certainly consumers are starting to feel more of a pinch. Uh, so we, I think we really need to uh, look at the demand side uh, much more closely going forward, not just the supply side. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, two important points there. One, uh, with regards to, you know, the, the international community of donors and governments and private sector, etc, pulling together to try and support the sector. And we'll come back to that a little bit later, but that obviously will be very critical. And, and rightly, you've said that there are, uh, there is a wide range of, of companies um, participating in the sector, very different sizes and scales. And we have two examples here today, possibly not reflective of the entire market. Nonetheless, let's hear from, um, from the businesses themselves. So um, Alex and then, and then Erwin, perhaps you could tell us, you know, how, how is the business uh, in Africa at the moment? How is the sector coping? And, um, you know, what, what changes have you been seeing? Thanks, Lisa and, and Chavi and William for initial comments. Um, I think you know the, the key thing I, I, I would I would say is it's, it's been really important to react quickly. Um, you know whether it's businesses in the UK or, or businesses in Africa. Um, I think you know if we go back uh, go back in time in March, you know, we kind of uh, saw COVID sort of taking um, taking hold in, in Europe. Uh, not so much in Africa at that point, but I guess you know we we did already think you know it is going to come at some point. And therefore, it's better to adjust the business as soon as possible. Um, so, really, if we go back into March, you know, we were uh, the initial thing that was impacted was supply chains, um, as as you noted. Um, I think uh, what was unusual about the timing of the supply chain impact was it just happened just before or just after Chinese New Year. Um, so, like most businesses within the sector, you know, we had basically, which is basically when China shuts down uh, for, for for Chinese New Year. 
uh, a lot of businesses had initially built up some inventory knowing that production you know is, is basically scaled back uh, during during the month of february so we kind of entered the crisis um, a little bit more with you know more inventory than normal uh, and, and which was helpful because you know shortly thereafter uh, supply chains were indeed disrupted um, factories and, and sort of factories in China, but also component, components became more difficult to secure. Um, shipping lanes were also uh, prioritized for healthcare uh, products, etc. So you know there was a little bit there was a sort of instability there. Um, I would say that's largely been uh, resolved. I mean it's still not as smooth as it is normally. Um, so even for us, you know what the way we're approaching that is you know building up slightly bigger bu um, stock buffers. Uh, given that we know that you know there's no you, you you may have products that sort of get stuck somewhere along the supply chain and uh, need to manage through that so that was the initial part of the um, uh, our, our response um, the second part of our response was really about adjusting the business uh, to you know deal with this sort of new normal at least for the next six to nine months um, and so, um, you know, you know, similar to uh, businesses in the UK, and as Chavi mentioned for Peg Africa, you know, we, we basically quickly virtualized the business. Um, so this meant that, you know, if you look at our UK operations, which are primarily focused on R&D and finance and marketing, etc., uh, pretty much everyone started working from home uh, at, the, at the beginning of March. Um, and really, the only people who were going into the office uh, on a um, you know as needed basis were basically our technical team and R&D team who needed to have access to laboratory and testing equipment. Um, and we've basically been operating uh, that way ever since. And I think we've all sort of been positively surprised how uh, relatively efficient has actually been working from home uh, despite what's going on. Um, then we moved over to our operations in, in Africa. And, and if I sort of break it down, what are the sort of main parts of it? Um, there's a sort of inbound logistics. Um, there is the uh, sort of call center activities we have. And there are also sort of agents uh, on, on the ground. Um, and again, you know, if you, if you think about the um, our sort of headquarters and the staff we have there, um, you know, similar to the UK, it was a question of uh, everyone works from home um, and only the, the people who were left in the office, um, which obviously had a lot more space to do so once everyone else had gone home, uh, was in terms of logistics and, and sort of product movement, etc. So, you know, that was fairly, uh, uh, fairly easy to implement. Um, the second thing was in terms of call centers. Um, so that it was a question of um, we have most of our call center activity in-house. Um, so again, that was a question of moving, um, allowing our, our call center staff to work at home. Um, that implemented that resulted in some changes to our, our PABX system, um, so they could basically do all the calls that they need to do from 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 home, and um, and that's how we've been uh, operating since. Um, then the third part of the uh, part of, the, of our value chain is clearly what happens in the field and with our agent network, etc. Um, I think uh, on the one hand we were sort of um, very fortunate that you know the government also recognised that um, solar is an essential service, so we were quickly able to achieve that status, which which meant that basically our our agents were were able to continue to move around and market relatively freely. Um, that said, um, there were obviously safety guidelines that needed to be put in place. Um, so any sort of mass gatherings of you know tra traditional marketing activities where you you gather 50 people in a market and try to you know um, educate them about your products you know that is obviously a much more dangerous way of selling the products um, given the potential spread of COVID um, and therefore we we ended up um, uh, basically re reducing that activity and really relying on more sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, type sales uh, sales approaches so really uh, uh, doing that way. But actually, our, our core focus has been uh, really serving our, our existing customers. Um, if you look at our existing customers, they are, uh, depending on which country, and I mean, in, in the case of Kenya, they were uh, under lockdown, and so spending a lot more time at home. Um, and basically, we, we really wanted to increase the value of our products while they were spending time at home. So a lot of our customers basically wanted to stay informed and understand, you know, how, how was COVID um, um, uh, basically penetrating uh, Africa uh, and what were the safety measures put in place so that they can basically inform themselves and keep themselves safe. Uh, when we talk about our TV products, um, interestingly enough, we have um, uh, basically a lot of families, their children are at home, 
Uh, and basically what we did was we increased the education pr uh, content uh, provision on our on our TV systems. So basically uh, children can continue to sort of learn while, while they're being at home. So really try to sort of add more value. And this is, you know, despite, and in, in as, as elders have mentioned, um, clearly our customers have a little, little bit less cash than they would have done normally. Uh, but again, you know, we, we have flexible payment schemes, which allows them to continue pay uh, as much as they can. Um, so that's really been our response. And um, I think as we all agree, we've made really good progress over the last seven to 10 years. Uh, and this is really a time where our customers need the service and we'll continue to provide the service uh, safely. Uh, you're on mute, Lisa. Lisa, I you're, think on you're on mute, mute uh, Lisa. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no yeah, just reminding everyone that that was Alex from Missouri. Uh, someone from the audience asked us to just remind uh, them where everyone was from. So, Owen from Rodavia, if you would like to um, just give us your perspective, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think uh, a lot uh, that's been said is, is applicable to, uh, to Rodavia. Uh, except that Redavia, of course, has a, a much more uh, B2B focus, a business focus. Uh, we primarily lease to own solar plants to SMEs, lower their electricity cost and carbon footprint, and effectively allow them to get through this crisis uh, better with a lower cost base. So for us, it was very much a question of uh, the, the COVID has had uh, upsides and downsides. It's been a question of mitigating the risk and, and capturing the opportunities. It's similar to, I think, what Alexander was, uh, was saying. In terms of risks, they're, they're similar uh, in the sense that, of course, first there's a health risk for our employees that we had to deal with and have dealt with like most companies. Um, in addition, there was the lockdowns uh, where we also have essential services status uh, and are able to continue and have been able to continue um, online. We were already uh, very much an online uh, uh, global company, so not much change there. In terms of further risks on the downside, uh, the current portfolio of, uh, of companies uh, that we serve. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, double checked that and did a uh, risk analysis um, exercise where we uh, looked at potential downside risks per, per vertical, so uh, for different types of businesses and, and how those sectors would be affected. Uh, we also check very carefully the uh, usage of the businesses, so the energy usage, which is a very good leading indicator of their performance uh, you know, as a business. Are they financially uh, in good shape? Uh, if they're producing, uh, that's a good sign. If they're producing, they're going to use electricity. So there we saw a dip uh, during the lockdowns for two, three weeks. Uh, and then now, except for a, a couple, really two, two companies, um, the, the rest of the companies are really back up to about 90, 95 to 100% uh, usage. So that's a very good sign. Um, you know, for example, we have one university as a, as a customer. Uh, they are at something like 70% usage uh, because they are still affected by lockdowns. Uh, but other companies, um, you know, in the service industry or manufacturing industry, uh, almost all of them are, are back up to a normal uh, usage and normal um, payment behavior, therefore, also for, for Redavia. So on the downside, we've you know, identified those risks, tried to quantify them uh, and isolate them effectively and then deal with them through, through monitoring and through um, dealing with any payment risks. A part of that has been the, uh, a new financing mechanism that we set up uh, outside of uh, the crowdfunding space uh, called the COVID Resilience Reserve. Uh, that's a $2 million uh, reserve, so a fund within Redavia that uh, is partially grant funded, uh, partially with um, zero interest loans and partially with interest bearing loans. Uh, and that allows us to deal with um, Companies that want to pay later, we can use, for example, the, the, the interest-free loans to defer some of that payments, but still keep Redavia whole as a, as a company. And also on the grant side, we can use that to plug holes. And the um, 
uh, interest-bearing loans we can use to actually accelerate the deployment of new projects. Because on the upside, uh, we also see a significant upside. Uh, our sales is actually uh, well uh, beyond budget, so we're better than budget uh, in terms of sales this year, uh, primarily because we're selling cost reductions and we're selling uh, cash conservation to businesses in a recession who are you know, clearly focused on uh, lowering their operating expenses. Um, so that uh, is, uh, is very attractive to them and, and gives us a, a, a very good uh, conversation starter. At the same time, we of course need to manage, you know, manage, manage the credit risks associated with that. But in terms of sales you know, flow and in terms of sales um, energy in, the, in our funnel and our pipeline, uh, it's been uh, actually a, a very active uh, you know, three, four months. Um, Specifically, also part of this uh, COVID resilience reserve has allowed us to offer the COVID resilience lease, which is then a sp special offer to set up long-term relationships to businesses, uh, but be extra um, generous effectively at the beginning of that relationship with a six months free uh, service. Again, backed up for us uh, by our small commitment from ourselves and then leverage that in with additional grant and uh, concessionary finance. So that's been uh, very popular. It's really you know, uh, got us a lot of attention and a lot of, uh, a lot of interest from clients. And from a financial perspective, it's a very uh, attractive proposition for the business also. Um, so for us, it's been very much in manage the downsides and um, uh, capture the opportunities also to, to support our uh, existing portfolio and also to add new businesses to the portfolio to then really come out of this crisis in six, six to 12 months um, you know, with, uh, with an accelerated business and a, and a healthy uh, lease portfolio. Thanks, Erwin. Um, I mean, that is the, that's the positive news that we want to hear, really, that in the context of sort of build back better, that there may be some um, there may be some businesses that really do uh, come out of this crisis uh, with a strong footing still and, and the opportunity to grow quite significantly. Um, we do deal with a whole range of businesses at Energize Africa. Um, Tobias, could you just perhaps give us a brief outline of, of how we've interacted with um, those investees? Over, over the last three months or so and, and the kind of variances that you've been seeing? Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa. Um, so I guess from, from the, you know, the earlies when we started seeing COVID impacts here at home in the Netherlands, um, you know, we started thinking, okay, this, this will at some point, um, you know, hit our target markets as well, at least the, the countries where our partners are. Um, but we had no clue, of course, on what would happen eventually, right? So um, when, when the first sort of indications were there that things were starting to uh, be apparent in those markets, um, we said as a team, let's put a stop to, you know, everything what we're doing, basically, and just take a time to, uh, to reflect and come up with a strategy, um, which is challenging as a, you know, small, uh, small platform, small company, um, the, you know, just for your information, to the audience, Energy Africa Africa's managed by uh, a UK team as well as a Dutch team. And the Dutch team also manages Lendahand, a separate platform. Um, if we take those together, uh, for me personally, we manage the portfolio of both, which is uh, 40 companies uh, in 30 plus markets, uh, all different sectors, uh, different stages, uh, different context. You just can't manage uh, to determine a uh, individual uh, solution for each of these businesses because they have all different needs, all different uh, struggles. Um, some even have opportunities in this uh, in this particular space, like like Erwin just mentioned with his you know sort of innovative uh, relief fund um, or resilience fund. Um, so we you know we had to find a a one size fits all solution at first, uh, simply because we don't have the capacity to analyze each individual company and, uh, and their struggles, um, which is on the portfolio side. Um, as an online platform working with you know, thousands of retail investors, uh, those are our clients just as much, right? Um, so on the one hand, you want to protect them by making sure that the portfolio companies um, are 
you know, doing well and they um, continue to, uh, to survive another day, if you will. Um, but we also have the investors who are eager to, uh, to support the businesses by providing more financing, uh, to, you know, alleviate whatever they can, uh, um, support in general. Um, but then we're also a company, right? So we depend on uh, campaigns, on future fundraising, on volume on the platform um, from our own income perspective. Um, if we sort of try to come up with a solution that, uh, you know, that supports all stakeholders, um, we ultimately came to a... Um, uh, a stop on future exposure buildup. Uh, so just pause um, with new deals, but also with existing partners who would like to raise more capital from the existing facilities. Um, that was to, you know, just not give our crowd unnecessary risks that we don't really know um, what the actual impact is. Um, while companies came to us asking for, you know, support in terms of alleviating cash flows, maybe in entering into longer grace periods or extending payment, um, restructuring in general, which again, as a small team with uh, limited resources, was just not something we could really accommodate to. So when we looked at all the stakeholders, uh, we figured that's, that's up for refinancing. That gives us the opportunity to at least present our investor base with some campaigns. Um, they can choose whether to invest or not. Um, it's up to them. That's the beauty, I guess, of, uh, of online investing. Um, they are in the driver's seat. It helps our businesses, the portfolio companies, to, uh, to at least alleviate their short-term liquidity um, you know, outflows. Um, it, it helps them to, uh, you know, limited cash outflows helps them to survive longer, basically. Um, some didn't really need that, um, which, you know, is fine. Um, if you can stick to the repayment schedules going forward, that's absolutely, uh, absolutely fine. Um, and some of them were, you know, disappointed even that we stopped future fundraising for the time being, at least because they depend on us for uh, for growing their business. Um, that's been three and a half months ago. Uh, since then, uh, I think we we know a lot better what's happening on the ground. Um, we at least now know what the unknowns are, um, which in in March and April we had no clue. Um, we have engaged in more monthly monitoring, um, just more frequent catch-ups with, uh, with our businesses, just trying to understand their needs and their struggles. Um, and we're getting to a point where we can probably um, start raising new funds again for existing clients as well, because it's just clear on what's, uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, but there is still quite some uncertainty in the market in general, um, in, in terms of, if I may add to uh, where William started, uh, and, and, and Xavi on the impact on companies. Um, what we're now starting to see is there are quite a few businesses who, um, you know, we're getting close to this break even point, maybe this year, maybe early next year. Um, but because of COVID, that's taken a, uh, a hit, which pushes back their uh, break even point, um, which totally messes up their, uh, their fundraising schedule because now they start to, you know, go back into the market traditional capital, whether that's equity uh, or debt, uh, ideally equity. But still, um, which in the current climate is, you know, even more challenging because a lot of investors are putting a hold on opportunities. Um, so these were companies that were doing very well, uh, getting to their break-even point, proving their model, who now have to go back into the market to raise capital, which, um, you know, we want to be there for our businesses, of course. Um, but as a, as a lender, you're not always the right product for those kind of companies. Um, yeah. So maybe maybe I can stop there just to know. Um. Yeah, well, I think that actually raises a, a really important point. Um, and to what extent do we feel that the um, marketplace has changed in terms of uh, being able to raise finance, you know, into, into sort of top co effectively, so not just working capital, but for these smaller businesses, um, do we still see that there are funds that are available for them to extend their runway and for them to um, get financing? Chavi, what, what's your experience there? I, I think it, um, in Ashton's network, we've found that most um, businesses um, are really sort of struggling if they are 
the tier two businesses, if they're not large businesses that are um, that that already have raised their funds and have a lot of uh, cash runway. So I think in in particular, I would say sort of as a Sort of ecosystem of, of suppliers and distributors that um, you know reach the the poorest customers that operate on the radar, um, and that are really to fail. Um, and I think they are the ones who are really struggling to to get sort of uh, financing in this period. And I think investors are uh, there are sort of relief efforts. There are. Um, funds being set up and uh, you know some grant funding being made available, but I don't necessarily think it's uh, reaching the right uh, companies or the ones who need them most. William, what do you want to expand on that? What's what's your perspective in terms of the, the bigger picture and, and you know international organizations, donations, governments coming coming forward to support? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I, I mean, it's it's hard to know still what the longer term picture is going to look like. I think where we're really focused right now is on the immediate term um, and trying to understand where the gaps are. There's a lot of activity that's been going on behind the scenes since COVID started. Um, as some have alluded to, there's a concessionary debt fund that's being created with a target of $100 million. Uh, that looks like it they may have a first close uh, at the end of July of about 30 million. So a third of the way to what they want uh, to raise. Um, but the, the criteria for that concessionary uh, debt fund is quite uh, stringent and most companies wouldn't be able to avail themselves of that, of that money. So a number of organizations, uh, AMDA, Gogla, Power for All, um, the Global Distribution uh, Collective have all come forward calling for as well additional money in the form of grants uh, totaling $35 million to act as a first loss uh, uh, for the, the concessionary debt fund, but also to enable some of the smaller companies to survive through this period um, uh, through uh, accessing grants. So. It's still unclear uh, exactly how much of that grant funding will become available, as as can be imagined, donors, others uh, with limited funding have shifted a lot of their effort towards uh, healthcare issues uh, currently. So it's it, it's a challenge for sure for the sector to try and access that grant funding. One of the things that we've also uh, seen, which is encouraging, I would say, is that um, many organizations are trying who can't move as quickly to try and mobilize uh, grant funding or other types of, uh, of capital are trying to reallocate existing money that's been uh, already approved towards supporting the sector. And so whether it's um, money that's been received from bilateral donors or multilateral development banks trying to repurpose money that's already been approved to help support the sector. So even though it might not be new money that's being uh, coming into the market in support, uh, many organizations uh, are trying to um, do a little bit of a dance to make sure that there's uh, money available in their existing programs as well. So, you know, I, I'd say that the, the focus really needs to be on the immediate term, especially on the grant side. Um, I think the, the concessionary debt fund will probably end up closing at the $100 million uh, target. I think the grant uh, facility is, is much more in question right now. Uh, Alex, do you have you had an Irwin? Do you think that there's enough money flowing to the sector to um, support your size businesses, but also the smaller entities? Um, Alex or Irwin? Well, I think uh, where exactly is it flowing? Right. I think I think uh, uh, you know if, if you look at Zoom out. If you look at the, uh, the reaction to the economic crisis triggered by COVID, you've seen in the US and the EU, you know, massive stimulus packages. Uh, in African countries, you've seen some, but, you know, way smaller, right? Uh, what Much, much smaller. And, and that's, that's been for Rodavia was the trigger to say, okay, we, we need to try and get some of that money from Europe to provide that additional uh, you know, buffer, uh, 
you know, in our microcosm of, uh, of our portfolio of lessees. That's effectively a, a small um, you know, piece of the economy that we can support with uh, the right type of stimulus effectively, uh, as long as we can fund it um, through uh, grant or donor money or uh, other concessionary debt, or as long as we can turn it into uh, a business you know, a financially viable proposition through a longer term con lease contract or a slightly higher lease contract later, like in the end, it has to add up. Um, so that's worked for us, like, or is working for us. We were able to raise now about a million and a half into this COVID resilience fund. Uh, we have been able to refinance uh, the funding we have outstanding on uh, the Energize Africa platform and on Lend a Hand you know, in time and, and easily actually. Um, we've, we've closed uh, one and a half million from the Nordic Development Fund last week for, for acceleration in Kenya. Um, so in that sense, yes, we are able to raise that money, but the, the point is the, the reason why we are raising this money is to get it to SMEs uh, in Africa to get them uh, through this crisis more easily, you know, as a business. And so that's, um, so yes, there is enough money, but uh, it needs to also uh, land uh, at the right people, right? And I think that the, the, their you know, work is required to get that done uh, one way or another. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think from our perspective, you know, generally there have been, you know, um, I think, you know, we've been encouraged by the, um, by the initiatives that have basically been kicked off uh, across the sector. And as William mentioned, there's the relief fund, uh, there are a number of fund prog um, grant programs, et cetera, that have been sort of announced. Uh, but as we all know, it just takes a bit of time to get them in place. Uh, and so what we have seen is uh, in terms of grant funding, it's been faster to reallocate um, existing grants uh, to, to this, uh, to resolve uh, COVID-19 issues. It's been obviously more difficult to raise fresh grants um, um, and get those approved uh, within the sector. So I think uh, again, it's all I mentioned earlier. It's all about speed, and I think you know what we're you know what we're all racing on is to for the sector is to basically get the measures in place sooner rather than later when it still makes a big difference. Um, and I think it's not only for the underlying businesses. You know, we we work with lots of um, small entrepreneurs, agents on the ground, etc. And during a period during this period, you know, you. I think the industry has built a large ecosystem of suppliers and, and, network, uh, and players, et cetera. And it's about you know, maintaining that mo the momentum of the ecosystem. Um, as I already mentioned, you know, we, we, we do, um, demand is fundamentally there. And the last thing we want to do is to take a step back and have to rebuild. We'd rather continue the momentum that, uh, because otherwise we're not going to uh, achieve SDG, SDG 7 in time. We need to maintain the momentum that we've all been building, and I think that's where um, grant programs and uh, and some of the relief fund programs are really helpful. Is just to make sure we continue to be on track and not be derailed by uh, by this um, uh, virus. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to start feeding in some of the questions that are coming in now. So um, you know, surely as we're seeing. Uh, you know, global economic fallout from, from the effects of COVID, particularly um, maybe Alex, in terms of the uh, domestic customers, you're, you're talking about more demand, but to what extent is there going to be the ability to pay because of this broader economic um, effect? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. I mean, from, from what basically what we've been seeing is that um, more of our customers are spending time at home, so that's one thing. So we've been focusing on really increasing the value of products. As I mentioned in the case of EV, uh, we've been increasing educational content, so really trying to um, you know, maximize the value of the product for our customers. Um, then it's a question of you know, to, to, to what extent have their incomes been impacted, uh, but also to what extent are they prioritizing um, um, basically the solar solar products and what we've really seen is that um, uh, even though uh, incomes have been impacted slightly they are kind of prioritizing to the extent possible uh, pago solar products uh, and by its very nature because we're pago um, customers have the flexibility to pay as much as they can 
And basically, you know, we, we were, we've always been uh, positioning our products to be uh, cost neutral relative to other, um, uh, to other competing products. And as a firm mentions, there's all that cost savings. Um, and so uh, providing the flexibility and a, a good value for money service, uh, that's really how we're helping our customers. Okay. And then just broader, um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the UK about a, a, a green recovery and, you know, this whole concept of build back better. To what extent, um, maybe Chavi, do you think that that is going to be a, a focus in Africa or is it just not on the agenda? Um, that's a really good question. I think... Um, it needs to be on the agenda. I think the energy access and the off-grid solar um, enterprises in, in particular um, are the foundation of the energy access sector. Um, and it's really important if we have to bounce back from this pandemic, um, you know, and we are looking at achieving SDG 7 and we are uh, you know, looking at tackling uh, climate change, uh, we need to sort of really do it uh, correctly, you know, make it, uh, sustainable and uh, a green recovery. Um, and I think it's not necessarily on the agenda because most enterprises are struggling with this life, um, in the case of the solar ones, and the enterprises have challenges of their own that they're facing. Um, but I think that we need to so start talking about it. Okay, thank you. Um, slightly different question here but something that i should have raised right at the beginning of the uh webinar is that we were trying to um get some african representation on the panel and unfortunately within the time constraints we didn't manage to do that which was um disappointing we will try harder for future um webinars but to, to what extent um erwin and alex is your growth about um building out in Africa and, and really bringing through African talent into uh, your expansion plans? It's super important. I mean, our whole business model is based on moving uh, capacity and skills and training from the initial core team that we have uh, in Germany and bringing more and more uh, of all those things to our teams in, in Ghana and Kenya. Um, and actually, the, the even greater digitalization of our work has, has made it so much easier to promote uh, team members in Kenya, for example, uh, to take global roles. Right? It's, a, it's a really, uh, uh, it makes distance almost irrelevant when all the meetings are uh, on, on video anyway. Uh, so we uh, last week promoted uh, our marketing manager in Kenya to the global marketing role. So we're spreading leadership, you know, around all of our offices instead of having it only uh, in, in Munich. Uh, our chief sales officer is, for the whole group sits in Ghana. Um, so of our management team, you know, it's really nicely balancing out and actually going digital uh, makes that uh, much easier. Um, yeah, and of course, like I was saying, our whole business model right now is around uh, finding, you know, future-proof, viable uh, cu customers for us, so companies, uh, and making sure that we give them a good deal now so they come out the crisis stronger and then become a, a customer for, for the next, you know, decade or decades. We, we, we sign uh, long-term contracts with these companies. Um, so that's very much um, the point of our business. Uh, and uh, so it, it's about making the, our, our countries, Ghana and Kenya, much more self-sufficient uh, self in terms of uh, the team. It's about having leaders for the whole group in all of the countries where we're active. And it's about providing you know, low-cost financed uh, solar farms uh, to businesses so they can come through this crisis better. Uh, so Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, likewise, from, from, from our perspective, you know, when the business was originally founded in 2012, again, we were a technology company based in, in Cambridge, UK, uh, with obviously most of the team based in, in the UK. However, you know, ever since, I mean, our basic operations have moved to Africa 
Uh, and currently, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the headcount is indeed in Africa and will continue to be skewed in, in that direction. Um, we, you know, even during this um, uh, during this pandemic, we continue to push our diversity angle and also our gender action plan. Um, so we made a commitment at the beginning of this year as well um, that basically 50% of new um, agent hires will be female. Uh, we've set up a Brighter Lives initiative will um, essentially help with mentoring and training, uh, etc. And so really, um, we have good evidence of the, the business case of uh, promoting uh, women within the business, and uh, that's what we'll continue. That we'll continue on that uh, agenda. Thank you. Something I like to hear. Thank you, um, Tobias. A uh, slightly different question, and William, please go ahead. You're on. Just, yeah. just to just to jump in on the on a similar topic. I mean, on a, on question of recovery, the International Energy Agency has put forward a plan or a proposal to. Uh, recover better by investing one trillion dollars each year over the next three years into the energy sector, uh, and there was a large focus in that in that proposal around renewables and energy access was also uh, prominently featured within that. So the call really is to governments to prioritize renewables uh, in the recovery and to make sure that energy access is a critical piece of that. It's up to us to make sure that that uh, filters down to governments and is loud and heard loud and clear. Um, and I think one of the key points that ties also back to uh, the question of uh, em employment and jobs is that our sector is actually a large job creator uh, for women, for youth, um, and that governments where in the countries where we're working need to also understand that. And Power for All put forward its first Powering Jobs uh, survey last year, which quantified that for the first time and showed that in Kenya, for example, uh, our sector already employs as many people as the national utility, KPLC, uh, in that country. And so it's already, it's a nascent sector, it's growing very quickly, uh, but it's in jeopardy just like every aspect of the economy is. And it needs to, we need to ensure that it has the support it needs in this recovery uh, to create jobs. Uh, and governments, uh, I think, increasingly understand that, but I think that that message needs to be, um, you know, delivered much more forcefully uh, moving forward. Good, that's perfect, thank you. Um, so we're coming up close to our hour, so I'm going to ask you all to um, give me a bit of a closing um, sort of viewpoint. So in, we, we obviously talked about, we backed up right at the start to talk about how important um, this sector is in terms of its uh, expansion to increase energy access and, and to work towards that sustainable development goal. Um, how important is um, the solar sector in achieving that and how can we do more to accelerate towards that goal, that SDG 7 goal? Um, so let's go, who would like to go first? Any, um, let's go Chavi, um, Erwin, and then we'll go from there. Sure, I think I said earlier that the uh, off-grid solar sector um, is really the foundation of the energy access sector. Um, and it's really important if we are to you know, work towards achieving SDG 7. Um, I really don't think we have much time left. We have, uh, you know, till 2030. Um, and I think we need to do everything we can to, to support sort of the energy access uh, sector and uh, all the off-grid players working with it um, to get through the COVID crisis, first of all, and then, you know, uh, help them raise the catalytic finance that they need, give them the technical assistance, the advisory support, uh, really sort of get them on the agenda, get energy access on the agenda of national governments if it not, is not already there, um, and really sort of help, um, you know, accelerate the transition to uh, 2030. I know Ashton is, is really trying uh, to do that in terms of supporting uh, the SMEs operating sector and uh, scaling up uh, the role finance plays. Thanks, Erwin. Yeah, for us uh, now, it's about you know getting to work basically, and 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 mitigating the risk of this downturn and and capturing the opportunities of it, so that we all, again, in our microcosm, that our businesses and the businesses that we uh, serve and are going to serve come out of the sec out of the crisis stronger, greener, stronger, faster, 
um, and can continue to employ people and can use this moment to um, become better, greener businesses. So, um, you know, we're into doing, <laughs> so we're going to basically accelerate our efforts and, and double down uh, on our business to try to help out uh, as much as we can. Tobias and then Alex and William, you can round up and finish. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we, we're, we're, we're all quite eager to, uh, to, to, you know, to get going again and, uh, and really start building out the portfolio, of course, from our own perspective, but also because we are an impact lending platform and, um, it would be a shame if, um, if we, if we lose our momentum as, um, you know, from our own perspective, but also as a, as a sector, um, because I think we were on the right trajectory and, and, and I hope that we can, you know, come back on track again very shortly. And I guess the, uh, the, the easy answer is that everyone needs to, you know, play their part. Every stakeholder needs to, uh, needs to double down as, uh, as Irvin says, and, um, you know, stay committed, I guess. Um, and we're seeing positive signs from that end. So we're, we're quite, um, you know, optimistic, I guess, of the near short-term future. Um, but we need everyone. Yeah, so maybe just to echo uh, Tobias's points, um, I mean, basically, you know, the, the, the industry has, has done a lot, a lot of good work over the last um, seven to 10 years, built up a lot of good momentum. And I think, you know, if we are going to have a shot at uh, achieving the you know, important goal of SDG 7, we can't lose momentum um, during this period. I mean, we, we, we clearly see the fundamental demand for our products is there. Um, our customers need the products and they need um, the, um, to be able to access them sooner rather than later. So it's really important for us to basically react quickly, navigate the, the current crisis, which we, you know, while it's clearly a difficult crisis, we do believe it's a short term um, uh, crisis and it's important to manage through that and really build back better and continue our, um, our, all of our efforts to get to SDG 7 as soon as possible. So I, I, I think it's really important, and we haven't really talked about it a lot, and so this could be our next webinar, it, it, to re remember that this is not just about SDG 7, it's about all of the sustainable development goals that are underpinned by access to energy, both cooking and electricity. Yeah. Um, and whether that's healthcare, whether it's education, whether it's food security through cold storage, whether it's yeah, solar irrigation uh, for agriculture and productivity, this is critical to all of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And so if we lose the momentum now, we don't just jeopardize our work uh, in terms of providing energy access, but also our customers work. And when I think about our customer, I mean the health ministries, the agriculture ministries, uh, the education ministries, all of them suffer if we suffer and, and don't come back stronger. So I think it's really important that all of us here and uh, all of our, uh, our listeners keep that in mind uh, because this is uh, you know, critical to development uh, in general. Perfect. Uh, excellent way to round off just to give us a broader perspective and, um, and line it up for the next uh, webinar. So um, thank you everybody for joining today. I hope that was informative to everybody listening in. Uh, we will provide some follow up. And as we said, um, please do feel free to come to our website for more information as well. Um, lovely, thank you everyone for joining once again and making time and um, see you all again soon. Thank you very much to the panel. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Bye bye. Bye.